Welcome everyone to our uh, May 11th board workshop here. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with our Pledge of Allegiance. If uh, Jennifer, if you want to get us. Sure, if I can get everybody to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Condon, if you want to get us started, or do we just go right to Micro May from here? Um, no, actually, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, as you know, we've been working with um, some of our consultants to um, develop a conceptual uh, drawing of what our elementary school may look like. Um, I have included Dr. Ehrlich in that work. He's been involved um, and has provided input and insight. Uh, Dr. Painter has been involved, uh, Ginger involved uh, Cindy Nelson and Dr. Bailey and Mike Romay as well. And then the last two meetings, uh, our, our president and vice president were able to join us uh, to be in the loop to see what was going on and um, just take a look at the design of the work we were doing. So um, at this time, I'm going to let Mike Romay introduce presenters today. Um, Mike. Thank you. Uh, from Bond Architects, we have Art Bond and Jennifer Carlson. And then from Navigate Building Solutions, we have Craig Sluter, Corey Baxter Mueller, and Joe Schweitzer. And um, both of these consulting firms were approved in March uh, at the ninth Board of Education meeting. We did go through a process. The, the process of selecting architects started in the fall of 2018 when we were uh, with our facility master plan study. Um, so we issued four architectural firms to serve as uh, architects for the school district to a, a three year, it was really a three year commitment to these firms. Um, and then this past spring, we went through an interview process and reference check and selected Art Bond or Bond Architects uh, to serve as the architectural firm for the new elementary school. And then with Navigate Building Solutions, we issued an art in January, January rep for our construction services. We also went through an interview process and reference check and then uh, made a recommendation and the board approved Navigate Building Solutions on March 9th. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to Art Bond and Jennifer Carlson. Mike, um, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is just to give you a brief overview of um, our background and kind of in reference to um, our school how that kind of leads into um, the work the steering committee um, to get to where we are with the uh, conceptual uh, diagram to present tonight. Um, first of all, of all, I wanted to mention um, Bond Architects has been um, doing work in uh, local school districts for over 28 years. About 80% of our work is um, K through 12 education. And um, we've been working in districts, um, neighboring districts like Maplewood, University City, um, Ladue, Pattonville Parkway, Hazelwood, um, among a number of others. Um, we've been in over 28 districts, probably 126 schools in the um, eastern part of Missouri. Some of the aspects that we really have brought to focus are our base initiative, which it stands back in 2015, 2016. We took a step back from the work we were doing and quite thorough investigative analysis of what 
around the country to keep the um, to keep school safer. Um, this was coming at a time when there had been a number of um, incidents in schools, and we what we can do to really follow best practices in uh, making schools as safe as they possibly can be. And I have to tell you that there are a number of things that came out of that, but first and foremost, and this is something I really take to heart, is schools have to be inspirational learning environments. And that is the first that is an overlay in the insecurity that gets put in place into schools because the inspirational learning environment, you've really lower of what education is all about. Um, the safety overlay that we put into place in schools is really second. It should be almost unnoticed as one um, walks through a school and is through. Um, there are a number of barricades that one would hit um, if you didn't have proper access, but um, it shouldn't be something that you that, that the student encounter in day-to-day -day activities. And um, so that's something that we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that as we look at how to uh, anticipate the new elementary school being laid out. And um, the approach is one, a series of zones at the um, school environment the, from the perimeter, working at its access points as you enter the school, as you work your way through and ultimately to the classrooms, um, which in the end are kind of the final safe uh, for students. But um, we'll, we'll get into a little bit greater detail and talk about the uh, conceptual layout that we're going to discuss tonight. Um, I also wanted to reiterate that these are very conceptual um, thoughts and the steering committee since early March, as Mike mentioned, and that there are a lot, lot of key decisions that are yet to be made after the run is approved. And uh, I think that what you're going to see tonight is kind of a first shot that what you really, we're going to see different of that that need to be really uh, and um, identified and, and further developed. We'll, we'll point those out along the way. but. We envision that going forward, there are gonna be a number of meetings with residents, parents and students, teachers and staff at multiple levels. I don't want anybody to think that this, um, but it is from which we can really start the dialogue. Um, I think it's also showing that what our priority is we look at the site and we say, okay, here's a, a fairly green open site. What are the priorities that um, we're keeping forefront as we move forward? Um, those would be um, to be good neighbors. Um, we want to screen the JRDs as much as possible uh, from light and sound and, and connection to the school. Um, we're interested in minimizing the amount of grading. There's a lot of topography to the site, and I think that it all really works nicely. Um, it's, it's a really fit. And as such, we need to be very cognizant of the way that the contours in the site uh, current figure and try to keep those intact as possible. We also um, are interested in saving as much of the vegetation that's out there. Um, we know that there are no trails and um, aspects to that that the district has um, gotten into and maintained over the years. And um, we think it would be very um, beneficial to bring those into play into the site, almost as being a school. Um, there's such a great setting with these 13 acres that um, the way in which we can design the building to make best that. Um, woodland area um, is really play off of that as much as possible. Um, and then 
the idea of potentially having the class have a feel in sort of a tree house being in the canopy um, as it surrounds the southern end of the site um, could be an interesting idea to work with going forward. Um, so with that, Pat, Jen, if you would um, bring up the uh, the first vignette, and I would have a question is along the way, please. Um, I, I think sometimes um, the question loses um, its benefit if it's held to the end. So we would ask you to jump in at any point. <clears throat> Now the first vignette here is um, kind of approaching the new elementary um, from the um, the Doherty Ferry Road approach, and you've kind of come into the site and you've stepped beyond uh, the par the parking lot sits in front of the building, but you approach the overlaying canopy um, for the drop off at the front of the school, and um, we envision a sort of um, still wooded using a number of the trees that are out there, but also planting quite a few new um, with rain gardens at the front of the building, which are kind of low vegetation, um, but they can be used for um, study and, and a number of projects for the students to interact as well. The building will have, <clears throat> we envision kind of a um, or an organic feel, um, low, predominantly one story. It may get a little bit higher toward the gymnasium and cafeteria and on the far left side of the site, but um, we envision the materials being um, fairly organic, uh, stone, wood, masonry, um, some fairly natural looking materials, um, all be them um, as, as durable as we can possibly use um, for maintenance of the, of the facility. But, um, the front door would have very much of a, of a um, hierarchy and delineation that this really is the front of the building. And um, upon entering on the right hand side here, you're looking at the administrative suite, which has strong visual command over the site and can see any vehicles or pedestrians approaching um, from the Doherty Ferry entrance and exit. And so that's sort of the overall uh, commanding view of the site and then coming in um, under the canopy um, into the single story element that then kind of on the back end of the site sort of steps off um, into two stories, but you're coming in on the upper level um, when you enter from ground plane on the north side of the building. As we kind of rotate the view to the southern part of the, um, of the focus here, you see that um, east-west wing at the top corner that is kind of the connecting spine, and you see a hint of the, the entry that um, we were standing in front of before, and, but then it carries through to the academic wings, and you've passed through um, that kind of connecting spline, if you will, that runs uh, kind of diagonally um, east to west, but then you've entered into the academic wings, which are these fingers that come off of the back of the building, the south side, and they step down. Um, so you're coming in and actually entering on the second floor of these spines, um, the academic wings, with um, then they step down in several instances to one story um, on the um, easterly wings. Um, and that's kind of how they tear us down and basically make best use of the topography and really kind of keep the buildings fairly low and um, keep them as much out of view of the adjacent neighbor, neighbors, although they're heavily buffered by the existing wooded edge um, down along the lower area, which is uncolored, kind of that, that white edge down below. Um, Jen, if you zoom in just a little bit, wanted to um, touch base on the rationale for using these wings allows you to get a lot of natural light into every classroom. And the, the classrooms will really kind of focus to the exterior. Um, both to the south and 
to the um, intervening um, natural kind of courtyards in between. And we envision that those as being very rich areas that are connected directly to the classrooms. Um, there might be vegetated gardens. Um, there would be outdoor classrooms, sort of an amphitheater um, shown down below in this circular portion. Um, there could be smaller play areas um, up in the upper right hand corner. Now you'll notice when we get to the site plan, things like this playground move around, they're shown in different locations. And that is to kind of really illustrate to you that there's a lot further study to come and that these are sort of the, the components that we envision in the site. We don't know the best location as yet, um, but it's to give you more of a flavor of um, the feel that the building will have and um, the sense that as you come down a, a corridor in one of these wings, you'll have a view through the end of the wing, um, the end of the hallway um, into the tree canopy beyond. And um, very much the sense that you'll also have from uh, most of the classroom uh, views as well. And there we do have show some um, little plazas running between a couple of these areas where um, art classes could be held. Um, a lot of uh, various outdoor activities could take place as well. Um, we do think that there may be some uh, retaining walls required depending on how the grade terraces down. Um, we know that that's going to have to be contended with, so we've started to illustrate some of those pieces um, as this is all being developed. As we were looking at the, the site itself, really what's outlined in black here in, in the upper left-hand corner, you see Doherty Ferry Road, which is the primary access, uh, ingress and egress point for the campus. Um, there will be a light, and we'll show you in the next view here kind of how that lays out. But what's important to point out is that where this red dash line occurs, um, and it kind of hooks a little bit down to the left from the midpoint. This is essentially the ridge line of the site. It's the high point, and um, it helps us to orient the building, knowing that that is going to be sort of the high point of the site, and that um, the primary um, east-west axis runs more or less along that diagonal line. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you see the flattest part of the site, um, which is kind of that um, kind of circular shape, um, oblong up there. And we think that that's, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a good place to locate the playing field, um, sort of a small um, size soccer field, um, play field, since it's per the most flat part of the site and it would lend itself well to um, orienting the field there. And then the building sort of acts as this um, diagonal spline within the wings as they step down into the, um, the receding grades, those wings uh, tear us down from the building as well. So Jen, if you can switch to the site plan, <clears throat> um, you can see in the upper left-hand area, um, where the intersection is with the, um, the stoplights there at Doherty Ferry. Um, and then you'll come into the parking lot, um, which is, and it, it really hasn't determined the, been determined what's the um, best size, but um, where you see the yellow buses stacked up, we, really, we think probably that that's going to make more sense um, being the vehicular parent drop-off. Um, in the, um, in the morning, and then the buses would likely stack up on the western edge of the building coming off of that fire lane um, so that you wouldn't have intermixing of buses and vehicles that kind of be flipped from what we're currently showing. Um, but we try to separate the buses and uh, parent vehicles as much as possible in the drop off and pickup. Um, then, 
so you see the primary entrance in the canopy right above there. And then that has a, um, a walkway, a pedestrian uh, vertical access that comes up through um, the parking area and then connects to the sidewalk um, up along Darty Ferry Road. So it will be the primary both pedestrian and vehicle point. Um, and I, I think it's important to note we're looking at um, a treed sort of canopy for traffic calming in that area. Um, we'll have different pavement um, to slow that down just so that it, it um, makes that as um, accessible as possible. We don't have vehicles crossing um, as students come through into the building. Um, then, as I mentioned, um, on the northern side of the building, we have a number of the public um, components, which starting from the right-hand side would likely be the gymnasium, um, the cafeteria, um, nurses suite, administrative suite adjacent, and then potentially the media center on the far west end. Um, these are all areas that can be accessed without, and, and I should say after hours, during hours, um, without having to go into the academic wings, which are the fingers that then come off to the south. And what could happen in this scenario is that the cafeteria and the gymnasium could be open for evening use to the community and have the remaining part of the building locked down and not have, um, have to have that open and makes for a very convenient um, setup and takedown um, for after hours use. Then from a safety perspective, um, the green spline that I referred to that runs along the backside of that component is the uh, circulation getting to the academic wings. And um, that has the advantage of Again, um, from a safety and security standpoint, if there is a scenario at the front of the building, um, the, uh, there are doors into each of these academic wings which can automatically be closed and locked down to secure the, um, the academic wings from the remaining uh, portion of the building at, at any time. Um, but again, then you see how these academic fingers um, come back into the more heavily vegetated area of the site. And really the whole perimeter is thought to be fairly densely wooded and that would continue. Um, you do see some of the small um, uh, trails going through the woods. Some of these are already established. Um, others could be um, reestablished. Um, there's the play field in the upper right-hand corner, and then a larger playground next to that. And then we've been talking about potentially have a, having a secondary playground, and whether that's down in the southwest corner or more proximate to one of these other wings, we just haven't determined that as yet. We wanted to give you um, just a quick snapshot of some of the class, different types of classrooms that we've done in elementary schools recently. Um, and I think the critical thing to acknowledge is that they're very flexible spaces. And whether they have little kivas built in for small group activity together, or whether they're larger tables that can be put together for project related work, um, there's storage around the perimeter of the classrooms. Oftentimes casework is built in um, to house those. This uh, classroom has direct access um, at grade to the outside. Um, sometimes that is achievable. Um, other times um, you might have to go through a, a hallway to a stair and then go down. But you get a sense for the flavor of what's being developed in the, um, in the classroom, very flexible space that can serve a number of different functions. 
Um, again, another snapshot kind of showing, we always feel that daylight is incredibly important in elementary schools and um, daylight, fresh air, and um, it's, it's just so important. And so you'll see that um, as much as possible, we try to bring light in through monitor windows, um, direct uh, windows to the outside, um, on several sides of the classroom as well. Um, there are also secondary spaces, oftentimes, we're seeing this as more of a trend, um, that classrooms have the ability to break out into smaller groups and move into secondary, um, smaller group work areas. And those oftentimes are adjacent, but um, either are open to the classroom or have some sort of glazing so that the teacher can monitor both um, while in the classroom and yet um, supervise the small group activity that's going on outside as well. Again, sort of more of the same. Um, some, we're seeing a lot of trapezoidal tables. I mean, I say that just as we go to the older configuration here, but um, we're using a lot of different types of furniture that is amazingly flexible. And um, they can be pushed and moved and reconfigured. And um, that's a huge trend that we're seeing in um, K-12 classrooms these days. Um, different storage and cubby lockers um, spread around the classroom. Um, sometimes they're project related, other times it's they're for personal use. Um, it all depends on kind of what the curriculum is and um, how much project work is related. Um, and, um, you know, the STEM initiatives push in to, um, in some cases, in the elementaries, we see them, uh, the STEM classrooms clustered together. In others, uh, we've also seen um, a scenario where the STEM classrooms might be in their respective grade levels. Um, this was actually a STEM classroom that was developed for a parkway. Um, and this is kind of prototypical that they're putting into place in a number of their um, class, in their elementary schools. Um, this is a more traditional classroom. Um, and um, oftentimes, um, there are water activities, sand and other um, play activities um, built into the room as well. Um, in almost all cases, you see uh, sinks within the classroom and um, oftentimes um, they can accommodate multiple students uh, together. Um, so this gives you a pretty good overview. Oftentimes, um, wayfinding is really critical. And um, we try to, as much as possible, identify classrooms and classroom pods with uh, different colored soffits out in the hallways to help orient the kids. Um, you just can't imagine a worse feeling than showing up at a school and not having any idea where you need to be and how to get there. And, so these visual cues are really important um, to children um, throughout the, uh, their, their year-long dialogue and then knowing kind of where they're going in the next year. Oh yeah, we're going, you know, going to be at the, the purple level. And um, we just find that use of color and materials can be so important in elementary schools and relating to kids and um, finding ways for them to connect in so many different ways. Um, this is an as a art classroom. Um, it was one that we did in the new uh, Barbara Jordan Elementary School uh, a few years back. Um, media centers um, and libraries are taking on um, any number of different um, appeals these days. I mean, they they serve so many different functions and. Um, we are finding uh, kids are using them after hours, um, before hours. Uh, they're great places. Kids um, oftentimes just don't want to leave. And um, they're just, they're wonderful places to be and um, they're exciting. And we really um, 
are designing those in many respects at sort of the hub of the school. And um, in some cases, classrooms pinwheel off of those. Um, this one, for example, had a Kiva in it, um, a number of soft study areas. Um, so we weren't sure as yet, as we're working with the new elementary school, whether um, the media center would be two stories or one. Um, it has the ability to be either um, going forward. And so we'll kind of get into that detail and look at it um, as, as the project is further developed. Um, again, media centers with also spill out area, um, small group areas, um, interesting one to note on the, the previous one. Um, this was actually on the right hand side, um, Jackson Park um, for University City. This was originally their gymnasium. And so um, utilizing that floor material and um, introducing some of these soffit clouds, um, brought it down to scale and made it much more acoustically appealing and uh, worked out quite well as their media center in that case. Um, cafeterias uh, serving many different functions and, um, you know, with, with stage backdrop um, in some cases. Um, and on to the next, um, different configurations, always um, well lit and typically adjacent to um, play areas outside. And in some cases, laid out in a scenario we, where you could actually um, have the kids dine outside uh, depending on what the weather's doing and so forth. Um, then um, gym and multi-purpose areas. This one really was a multi-purpose room, not so much a gym, um, but used for a number of different, uh, different functions. Um, and then more traditional gym. Um, and Mike, you had asked about, you know, the ability to have, we envision the gym as being the uh, storm shelter in this particular configuration, just because it could house the entire school quite, um, quite easily. Um, and you had asked, is there an ability to have windows? Yes, you can. Um, in this particular case, and I think this is Cape Girardeau, um, we had to have storm shutters um, on those windows, but we did have um, daylight coming into that as well. Um, this was Maplewood Richmond Heights. You're in the gymnasium looking through into the cafeteria beyond, um, which also has a hard surface curtain uh, that closes off the, the backdrop for the stage behind. somewhat similar in another, and then some um, small Kiva areas um, outside of the classrooms. Um, tutorial and small group work can be done in these areas as well, and they take on many shapes and forms. Again, daylight from above um, on the, in the Barbara Jordan uh, image on the left, um, classrooms coming off of that wing, and then uh, Ladue. Um, and then you start to get into some of the administrative uh, functions as well. And again, it, it, we try to carry through the themes of the colors um, and yet um, add a little bit flavor a little bit different flavor to those. So I, that really, um, I'd love to entertain any questions that folks might have. Um, I have kind of a number of different statistics for you, uh, you know, about site coverage and things like that, and we can get into those, but I suspect you have more important questions to start. Yeah, I'd like to, let me, I'll make a statement and I'll open it up. First, I, I, you had a, a lot more detail this week, so thank you. 
for uh, art for you know adding some things, playground and some other things. But as I think about the curriculum and how our our teachers and our staff and our students are accustomed to a certain rigor, the way this building lays out plays perfectly into the type of learning that that I know our children are accustomed to. So thank you for working so hard to put that together. And any any board members, uh, if you have any questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of peruse through and see if I see any hands raised. Uh, that anybody who wants to, to ask first, go right ahead. Jennifer, is that a hand raise? That was that was a very tentative hand raise. Um, no, I I echo what you just said about the detail um, from what we saw last week. I really appreciate the emphasis on safety um, through you know just being in the building, the site, all of that. I think that that's really something um, that's important. Um, and I also was curious if you could maybe talk a little bit more. You mentioned to be cognizant of the contours and lighting, right? And talking about vegetation and all of that. Could you talk a little bit more? Because I know how much time you spent on that. It would be really nice to know just, you know, how much vegetation we can leave and, and the importance around that edge. That's it. <laughs> That's a great question. And honestly, that is um, kind of a, a, a huge part of what we were really focusing on um, in the early stages of, as we looked at what would be the best configuration. Um, because if we, Jen, if we could go to the site plan, um, uh, there we go. Um, we have yet to do the tree survey, but that is gonna be forthcoming and that will help us to identify all of the specimen trees that are out on site. And um, what's interesting to note is that this was a grove at one time. Um, and it, it, when in the, I guess it was back in the 50s when it was farmsteaded, and I don't know if it was an apple orchard or what the, there were a number of trees planted um, for fruit harvesting. And um, over the ensuing, uh, 50 years, things went fallow, and but I think you've got some pretty neat specimen trees in here. And um, what our our approach is to try to um, address the site from the inside out, almost, and try to as much as possible keep from touching the perimeter edges, um, and really leave that as much as we can, and um, thin out kind of as you, you work your way from the outside in um, to the point that we need to do grading and we do have detention basins in each of the lower right and left hand corners which are kind of low points in the site where water will naturally gather and then can be piped off but um, water flow off the site is tremendous concern and keeping the, the uh, dense wooded areas is going to be really helpful in kind of maintaining that and helping us to um, channel the water to the detention basins and um, really keep um, the adjacent neighbors from seeing much of anything into the site. Um, what's interesting to note is the um, house to the south, immediately um, to the south, which is I think probably the most proximate neighbor. Um, that's a pretty steep climb on their site. And quite frankly, I think as if one were to look from their house up, I don't believe that you would even see the ridgeline of the academic wings coming down to the south. Part of it um, due to the density of the wood, uh, the wooded portion, which I think is even gonna be more dense than what we show. I think it'll actually overhang the fire lane to a certain degree, but um, it's such a dramatic rise in elevation at that point and everything will flatten out a, a good portion of it um, as you get onto our site. So um, that's something that we're gonna be very cognizant of going forward.
Thank you for mentioning that because I was I actually that was one of my questions when, last week when we talked about that the the view from the neighbor and them being able to to kind of have to look all the way up to see you know into the property. I think it'll be pretty well um, pretty well masked off really by the density of the woods there. Art, could you talk a little bit about um, the amount of concrete and how, what efforts could be made to potentially slow runoff there? Absolutely. Um, and this was a, a question that had come up earlier too. And I think that um, in working with our civil folks, um, they've already expressed an interest in using uh, pervious paving whether it is pavers or pervious concrete um, through much of the site to retain the water and not have the watershed effect that so dramatically um, has impacted um, the region in the past. I think it's one of the tools that we'll use to, um, again, make sure that we're not um, shedding a lot of water from the site. And I think it's likely that much of the parking area is going to be comprised of that, um, which will allow the water to percolate down into uh, the rock base below and then slowly seep through. Um, and oftentimes that's channeled um, at the uh, perimeter limits and taken down into the storm detention basins, um, which then slowly dissipated as well. But I envision that probably the entire um, fire lane would be comprised of that. And we're looking at some other possible um, plantable pavers as well um, in there. But then a lot of the area um, up at the northern part of the site would be that pervious paving. Could you talk a little bit about um, how it will be determined, like what grade levels will be situated in what parts of the building? Um, how, how is that usually done? That will be done through a series of uh, conferences with, um, with the teachers and, and staff to really look at um, how your curriculum is structured and what makes the most sense for um, um, basically what grade levels to be located in which wings. Um, as we mentioned, sort of does STEM um, go um, get located with each of the grade levels? Um, what are the um, auxiliary, you know, where is music going to be? Where are um, SSD classrooms going to be located? Um, all of that curricular interaction has yet to be determined. And um, it's possible that these wings could morph quite a bit um, as a result of that. And this is kind of a, an initial first blush, but um, really the curriculum will determine the shape of the back of the building and how this all comes together. So do you envision, is that usually done with like committees with teachers and parents and um potentially it, community members? It will be, yes, very much. Um, I think, you know, I think the community will be interested in how the building is used and where students are going at various times in the day. I don't know that, I think the curricular side, and you, I'm sure, have cur curriculum committees that will help us focus on this, um, comprised of the teachers from various subject matters, um, and grade levels. And so that will take some very intensive study and it will be um, a fairly long gestation period as we review what types of, um, what the classroom sizes are. Does a 900 square foot classroom make sense? Does it need to have small group tutorial adjacent to that? Um, are there science classrooms, STEM classrooms proximate? Um, what are the storage needs? Or are you doing a lot of um, project-related work? Um, we'll really kind of get down into the very nitty-gritty aspects of um, what the needs are for 
both current curriculum and envision future curriculum too, because I think it's important that everything has the appropriate flexibility to carry um, your uh, your curriculum into the future very much. Mike, would you maybe talk again about the timeline for when, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jean Marie. Are you, are you sure? Yeah, absolutely. Am I good? Yeah. Okay. Um, first, I, I just want to thank you for all of your work on this. I think that um, you have done a great job on this. And I really appreciate the fact that you have been very mindful of the neighbors surrounding this, because I think it is one of our goals as a board and as a district that we are good neighbors uh, to our neighbors. Um, so one of the one question that I do have as the finger, the wings come out, is there access doors between wings? I was just thinking for, you know, for example, for, you know, special ed services, if a special ed classroom is in this first wing, but they're servicing a child in the third wing, can they get out the first wing and walk outside to get to the third wing? The, <clears throat> yes, in the in the um, when we've used a wing concept in the past, there has always been an ability to uh, to transition from one to another um, through a series of um, access points without disrupting um, classrooms or classroom suites in those as well. Um, whether it is typically it's it's some sort of a hallway connection and or has the stairwell um, in it as well, because each of these would likely have a stairwell at the end of each. Um, and, and that raises another point too um, that we haven't talked about is there will be perimeter fencing and we don't know as yet where that would occur. Certainly it'll occur around the, that sort of black border that you see around the perimeter, but there is likely gonna be some secondary fencing as well to um, help with kind of student control um, by the teachers. And um, so it will be a safe area for you to be able to uh, transition through there. And um, this whole area we really see as kind of being the student safe area um, at the back of the building, if you will, out of traffic and so forth. Okay, and then just one more thing. I, I think it's really important as we move forward and I, this might be a district thing that we kind of get feedback from our other school neighbors and kind of figure out like what are some of the things that have really worked for those neighbors and some things that maybe don't work for them that that we could possibly not repeat a problem if they you know um so i would just um encourage whoever's job that is to kind of get feedback from, you know, our existing school neighbors to make sure that um, we're getting that information. And let me look at my notes. Oh, the other piece that I really liked with this is being a former teacher, um, the small workspaces off of your classroom is just so beneficial in so many ways you can have an interventionist or an SSD service. You know, it, you can have small groups there where, you know, sometimes children say if they're going to speech, they go down to the speech room where maybe that service could be um, provided right there. Um, and it cuts down in the track, you know, the time spent in between and, um, there's more time for service. So this is exciting stuff and I really thank you guys a lot. Thank you. Any other questions from board before Michelle? You guys can go ahead and jump in if you get if you have anything, Michelle, go ahead. Well, I was just going to um, ask Mike Romay again to talk about when uh, the timeline for when the school would potentially open, because I know that, you know, right now we're in the midst of um, the coronavirus and 
responding um, to that and looking at the potential for some modifications to our, our schedule for next year. But when this does pass, um, and, and we know it will, we're going to have full classes again with kids and possibly more students, uh, depending on how the economy affects um, you know, the, the potential for added students. So Mike, if you could review again the timeline for when this could, the school could open. Sure, we, our goal is to have it open for the 22-23 school year. So two years from now is when the school would open. The, um, the building additions that are also included in Prop S will, will take one year. So, um, so we think we can have the additions on the other schools done for and ready for the 21-22 school year. But this new, the, the new school on, off of Doherty Ferry, um, that will take two years. So we'll, we have all the um, pieces in place to kind of get started right away soon after the election. And so we would start the design work um, and, and meeting with those committees and to determine exactly you know, what the new school should look like. But that process will, will likely take six months and then we would bid it out and start construction as soon after. Uh, but a full two years uh, to complete the building. Thank you. I gotta say, you guys done a great job. Uh, very impressive. Uh, that outside, uh, in between the, the the wings, the sort of fingers that come out, um, that area looks great to be able to have access to and our kids. So thank you for all your work on that. Thank you. If I can just mention, um, I had an opportunity to talk with um, Art and and his team about the the potential of how the space might be used not only for play but also to as part of our curriculum um, and i was very impressed i mean their questions were, were so smart and um, it, it definitely gave me confidence that they saw the potential and how the space could be used at an element as an elementary setting um, but then when i saw the the, the the designs as preliminary as they are um, knowing that we still have many people uh, to have their voice a part of this process and many teachers who can help us make it even better. Um, but it, it felt very, as, as Art said, very organic. It's almost as if this, this school um, almost grows. It, it's almost grown on this land. Um, that's the way it looks. And I think that there's so many neat options and, and potential for our kids to use the entire property. Um, not just the school, um, the, the school building itself, but the entire property is a learning space. Thank you. Great point. Well, I, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Dr. Connie, did you have anything else for us or are we? No, I don't. Just that we have a regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting on uh, next Monday, the 18th at 7 p.m. We really appreciate your hard work on this project and you really listen to everyone's input and, and you listen to the concerns that we brought you from our neighbors um, and the importance uh, um, that the, the building really looks like it belongs on the land that's there and is not something that is um, look like it would just was just plopped on that space. So I really appreciate your uh, your listening skills and and then the way that you can um, just creatively put all of that into a structure that um, really seems to fit on the space. I just um, it's pretty amazing. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to th say thanks also to Art and his team, and then also to the team from Navigate. So it's it's really exciting. We we love the design work and can't wait to get started. We can't wait as well. <laughs> Be fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys very much. You guys have a good day. All right. Thank you. All right. Talk to you guys later. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Darnell.